Okay, grab a seat and we'll give the floor to Al. Okay, so we're going to be talking about building antennas. You got your rig. It's the greatest thing that, you know, they ever made. I mean, it can do everything, include wash dishes and, and cook dinner. But you got to have something to be able to get all those oscillations inside that radio out into the atmosphere. If you don't, they just stay inside the box and don't do anything. So how do you do that? And like it says here, you know, antennas cost money. Gosh, the transmission just went out on the car. Uh, water heater died. Money always seems to go someplace else, and your antenna that you would really like to put up isn't possible right now because the expenses are there. So you can build your own antennas and be able to talk to the world still, even if it isn't commercially manufactured. <laughs> Why do you need an antenna? Inside the great transmitter, your voice, your key or signals uh, change the radio oscillations inside there, and, but you need that antenna to be able to launch it out into the sky. What are the different kinds of antennas that you have access to? Whip and monopole, those are the things you'll have on your HTs. Uh, loops, uh, that's an antenna, it's good for directional uh, transmission and reception if you uh, need to track something down. If you ever watch old World War II movies, they got a loop antenna up on top, you know, and a direction find with it. Or if you see one of those sitting outside your house, uh, and you might have a little government sticker on the side, you know, to kind of calm it a little bit. Bow ties. These used to be popular uh, for uh, TVs, TV antennas. Uh, you'll see those uh, sometimes on uh, VHF, UHF frequencies. Dishes, dishes are everywhere now. I remember the first dish I saw was a six foot diameter thing, you know, for a satellite, uh, satellite TV work. Dipole, pretty basic antenna, and it's, it's used everywhere. I mean, there are dipoles inside your cell phones, and there are dipoles everywhere and you can use it vertically or horizontal depending on what you uh, need for your propagation. Yagis, uh, that antenna is, uh, was developed back way before World War II and um, you'll, you'll see those antennas anywhere from that big printed on some circuit board and being used uh, for uh, transmission and reception to giant log periodic antennas like up at the Federal Center and, and out at Schriever and stuff. Huge antennas, some of them are as big as this room, but they talk multiple frequencies all over the world with them. Can you build your own antenna? Yes! You can build your own antenna. And for the most part, it doesn't take a lot of exotic equipment to do it. If you can pass a ham radio license exam, you can build your own antenna. Even if you can't pass the exam, you can still build your own antenna. <laughs> There's hope! What are the materials that you can use to build your own antennas? Aluminum rods, aluminum tubing, all different shapes of tubing available to make your antenna the coolest thing in the sky. Uh, ceramic insulators that are used for uh, the ends and, and center portions of antennas. You can get a spool of 500 feet of wire at Home Depot uh, for about 50 bucks. It's 500 feet and you can make a lot of antennas with that. Uh, copper. Copper is an excellent thing for building antennas and I'll be showing you some examples here tonight. Plastic. Plastic is a good thing to use too. I know when uh, we did the uh, fox hunt last, uh, last uh, summer, the, uh, using the plastic tube as a base for attaching your, your uh, uh, tape measure parts to, you know, to make your Yagi antenna. Readily available and pretty darn cheap for the most part. Equipment that you need to build your own antenna. You may want all of this, you may only need parts of it. Soldering iron for working on wire antennas. These basic tools for working on wire antennas and also other, other types of antennas. Screwdrivers, I don't have screwdrivers on here. Hacksaw for cutting tubing and rods. Uh, 
this stuff over here mostly for uh, soldering and copper and building copper uh, antennas. What antenna to build? Man, I, I mean, there are so many types of antennas out there, you can't believe it. Uh, the antenna that you, you want to build is the one that you need, the one that you're going to use. Uh, you know, building lots of antennas that aren't going to be used, that's, you're wasting a lot of time, uh, in, unless you really like designing things and building. And, and that's one of the cool aspects of, of this type of work for antennas, is if you like to construct things and design things, there's all kinds of things you can design with uh, uh, building antennas. Can you build an antenna? Yes, again. It doesn't take a lot of exotic equipment to do it. Building antennas does require learning some skills. If you're going to do the copper pipe uh, antenna stuff, you need to learn how to solder. And it is really easy. I'm going to show you a little video here on how you solder copper pipe. And if you have a house, you probably have copper pipe in the house. Uh, copper has been used for, jeez, um, probably 100 years uh, in house construction. It's uh, excellent uh, thermal conductivity and water doesn't normally flow out of it unless there's a hole. Uh, when you're building antennas with copper pipe, you don't have to worry too much about the leaks, except that you kind of like to be able to put your antenna together so you don't get water inside of it and fill up and eventually start to freeze and crack the pipe and stuff like that. water, but it's the same thing for air in RF. Water supply pipes made with copper pipes and fittings may cost a little more than other types of pipes, but a well done copper installation will make you feel like a true professional when it comes to doing your own plumbing. The project we're about to demonstrate will give you the basics of connecting copper pipes and fittings with a heat connecting process known as sweating. If you follow the simple procedure we're about to show you, you'll be able to safely create watertight joints with no problem at all. Start by determining the length of pipe you need. It should reach from the back of the socket on one fitting to the back of the socket on the next. Here's a closer look at the way this works. Measure between the sockets and mark the pipe to be cut. Assemble the pipe and fittings and make sure they fit correctly. Take the pieces apart and brush a thin coating of soldering paste onto each end of the pipe in a strip around an inch wide. Brush paste inside the fittings too. Don't be too generous. You don't need a lot. Unwind 8 to 10 inches of solder from the spool. About two inches from the end, bend the solder at a 90 degree angle. Finally, you're ready to fire up the torch. Move the inner part of the flame all around the socket, heating it for several seconds. Touch the solder to the joint. If the copper is hot enough, the solder will melt right away. Starting at the highest point, push half to three quarters of an inch of solder into the joint. The solder should be drawn into the joint, leaving a thin bead around the lip of the fitting. After a few seconds, use a dry rag to wipe off any excess solder. Be very careful, the pipes will be hot. If you follow the instructions exactly, you'll find yourself with a plumbing connection that will be impossible to distinguish from a professional plumber's work. So that basically is how easy it is to solder. You can, you can do a joint in about uh, a uh, solder joint. takes about 15 seconds to heat up and run your solder into it.
Okay, we're going to kind of, we don't have a, a lot of time tonight to cover a lot of things, but I'm going to give a good brief overview of, of uh, how you build antennas, and then later on in the year we'll be able to do more definitive stuff on different types of antennas. Here is an antenna that I want to build, and it looks so nice. And now you're going to solder it all together, okay? There's, there's joints here, joints here, all around joints. And now you need to solder that together. Once you start getting ready to solder, this is what the antenna will look like as you start to work on it. <laughs> It'll look like that. And as you try and put those joints together and get them heated and everything, things are going to move and turn and twist, and it, you're not going to end up with an antenna that looks so nice and squared. So what you do is you get yourself a soldering pad. This is a, uh, no, I don't have it here. Anyway, a soldering pad is a, almost like a piece of ceramic that absorbs and insulates uh, heat and keeps it away from whatever's underneath it. Get yourself some uh, pieces of wood that are the same thickness as that soldering pad. And now you can just prop everything up and now it's all in the same level. You don't have that twisting problem or or have an antenna that's just a little bit off because everything is now level. Once you build your <coughs> antenna, what do you do with it? How do you make it work? What you want to do is you want to be able to have an antenna that is tuned to the frequencies that you want to operate on. And you use equipment like this. This is a little $98 antenna analyzer for HF frequencies uh, at, off of Amazon. Um, this is a little more expensive SWR meter. But when you're building an antenna, let's say you're building a, a wire antenna. I'll pass this around. This is, these are all the parts to build a uh, fan dipole antenna for three HF bands got all the parts in it to be able to do that. And here's another thing you want to think about when you're building antennas, how heavy they can be and where you're going to put it up and what you need to, to use to, to hang it. Is it the door prize? <laughs> <laughs> here's a quick run. <laughs> here's, here's another another thing to show you on uh, building your own antennas. You know, you can, you can, this is a little a mini demo antenna, but some Schedule 40 PVC pipe, and you can make your center insulators, you make your end insulators. You don't need the ceramic ones. Uh, these work just fine. And uh, as you uh, build an antenna, a good thing to do is I, I like to calculate what the length of my, my, uh, uh, you know, transmission, um, the elements are for the antenna. And I usually, on a wire antenna, add about 5% to that. And so that becomes this little tail on the end. And uh, what that gives you is the capability of trimming it to the frequency you need. Adding the 5% usually takes care of the, the enough length that you're not going to have a problem later on with an antenna that's too short. Now what do, you, what do you do if you have an antenna that's too short? You solder another piece of wire on, right. Uh, you want to have the antenna wire the same on each side, but it's, it's simple to make your own stuff uh, out of very cheap, cheap uh, wire. You can probably put together a good uh, 80 meter antenna with a spool, you know, with buying a spool of wire, or even less than that, um, for, geez, Twenty dollars at the most, uh, and that's you know that'll fit in just about anybody's budget. Although when uh, you were talking, go ahead. I was wondering, do the tails count as the length? Yes. Uh, yeah. What it does is it goes down to that, and then I trim them off as the SWR meter tells me. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now the other thing that's nice uh, that I like to use a tail for is I'll I'll add another piece of piece of wire coming out this end. So I could have a 40 meter, let's say a 15 meter cut. I could add another piece of wire that's going to be for 
40 meters. And then what I do is I put a clip on here, clip it to that piece of wire. So now I've got a 40 meter antenna. I can have another insulator, add another length of wire out for 80 meters. So you can have a three band antenna with just, just wire and clipping from one to the next. But if you use it on each of the bands, you'd have to disconnect it at that proper length. Yeah, yeah, you, you, and you trim it. What you do is you trim that first one to, let's say, 15 meters, add another length of uh, wire on for the 40 meter section, and then trim that to length fully attached with the two sections, and then you do the same thing for the 80 meter section, trim it. Um, because what, in essence, what you end up with is just one long piece of wire for the 80 meter se you know, section, it's all connected. Are they disconnected somehow? So if you're using the 15 meter one versus a you know, great big one, two connected, because you said basically you clip it? Yeah, what you do is you, every, time you, change band, every time you change bands, you got to go out and unclip it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> now, later on, what you do is you build traps. Okay. And traps are things that electrically do the same function as going out and disconnecting that thing. Um, when you're uh, uh, doing the, the work for soldering, this is, this is that tool that you use for cleaning the copper. The copper oxidizes <coughs> in, the, in the air. You can see that it's kind of uh, dark in color. You have to have it clean in order for the solder to attach to it. And what the flux does is it kind of uh, helps that cleaning process after you clean it with this tool, but that also prevents air from getting back into that soldering joint when you heat it. Like you showed on that video, once you, do, once you touch that solder there, when it's heated, the solder just gets sucked into the joint. Uh, it, uh, it, it just moves right through into the joint. So when you're, when you're cleaning it, you'll find that this thing will turn in one direction real easy, and it won't turn in the other direction as easy. If, you, if you're weak, you can just rotate it in the direction where it's, where it's uh, easy. But I like to take it like this, you know, and, and clean it up. And now you can see how bright and shiny that is. And that's what you want your solder joints to look like when you're, when you're putting the parts together. Whatever part is going to go on top of this, like let's say you have an elbow that you're going to use, this little end piece is for using on the insides. And this also is one of those deals that goes better in one direction than the other. Uh, depending on how, how old it is, it, it can go pretty well. But you want to clean, clean both uh, pieces, and you put it together. You put that flux on with that brush, and then you put them together. Heat the joint, and a, a good thing to do is to heat it on one side. Just kind of keep your heat moving on one side, about the, about the width of this, this joint. Move it back and forth. And then apply your solder to the other side, uh, and it'll suck suck in, and it'll move right around the joint all the way to the heat. It wants to go to the heat. Uh, is, is the way the solder works when you're doing soldering work. This is the cutting tool that uh, you'll want to get, and when you're cutting uh, copper pipe. Put the, uh, you know, make a mark on the length that you want to cut to. Clamp, clamp it in, and it's good to rotate in the direction that the opening is, like this. Usually do about two, two turns, I usually do about two turns, and you'll see a score line begin to appear on the copper pipe. Tighten it a little bit, rotate. You don't want to tighten it, tighten it so tight you can't move it anymore. Rotate it about two turns, tighten it a little more, two turns, and that's it. Now, on, on these uh, tools, there's also, if you were doing a lot of water work, on these tools, there's a little deburring tool that you can put on the inside to take off any burr that may uh, appear on that. 
So that would, that's what you would, that's how you cut cut the uh, copper pipe. Now I have a let's say that you're doing a, making a Yagi antenna or a, a vertical antenna using copper or aluminum rods. It probably works too if you had thin enough copper. But if you were to have an aluminum rod and you can't find that 48 inch piece of aluminum, how the heck do you make that 56 inch piece of uh, vertical element that you need? Well, these things work really good. And they, you can put an aluminum like a 3 16 or 3 8 rod into these things. And what you do is you take, take it apart. Now, this is a T because sometimes I use T's in antennas. Um, but uh, you can just use a coupling also. You take out that little bushing that's inside and put the uh, antenna rod in there and tighten it down. But you can also get the bushings that uh, are the same diameter as the rod that you're working with and that will even hold it tighter into the, into the fitting. So the Home Depot is a great place to go for antenna building parts. Now I've got a couple examples of antennas here that I've built. This one I built 35 years ago. Uh, it's a dual band J pole. There's a two meter section here, and this is the 440 section. And it, the 440 section doesn't see this, and this doesn't see the 440 section either. And it's another one of those deals when you build an antenna. The book or the drawing says these are the dimensions. Not necessarily so. Uh, what you do is you kind of build it to the dimensions plus a little and then tune it. And it's that, that tuning process that gives you an antenna that fits your location and your rigs and whatever atmospheric conditions are happening in, in your location. I, I had this up in my house in Golden for many, many years. Question for you. Hmm? How do you trim something like that? Well, like this thing, what you do is you loosen the nut, you move it a little bit, you go to your antenna analyzer or USWR meter, and you transmit. Usually, if you can transmit a tone, like a CW tone, that's, that's the best way to do it. Uh, transmit a tone and uh, find out what frequency your lowest SWR is. If the, uh, the, the frequency, and you do the same thing with a wire antenna, if the frequency is too high, then you need to adjust this thing in a different direction. Now you may not know, well, which direction do I go? Well, move it and then transmit again and see what effect that had on the antenna tuning process that you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so you're tuning it based upon the, the large pole by moving that in and out. Well, on this, what, what uh, a J pole, the way a J pole works is the antenna part is on the 440 is this length across here and up. It doesn't even care what this is. Okay. This could be a 200 foot long piece of pipe, it doesn't care. Uh, the portion on the bottom is similar. It, that antenna is based on this across here and up to the top on a J pole. Okay. Now, if, if you were tuning a vertical, you'd have a, a similar situation where you have your counterpoise bottom uh, or uh, uh, you know, some really ground plane leads going out, and then you're adjusting the length of that uh, vertical antenna segment. Right. So you just transmit, see where the thing uh, is uh, tuned to, and then make an adjustment, and you really don't have to know which way to move it because once you make a couple adjustments you'll see what the effect is as you move this thing back and forth. Now we had Tech Day uh, geez, two years ago, three years ago, something like that and um, Bob gave a presentation on fan dipole antennas and that is a, an HF antenna where you have one coax going up to the, the trend, you know, the contact point and you have like three wires going out different frequencies and so you can use that as a multi-band antenna. I went home that night and I was <coughs> thinking about his presentation 
I thought, wow, you know, I bet you could do that for a VHF antenna and maybe make a dual band V, you know, dual band out of copper. So I, uh, a couple days later, I played with it. And like I said, I started out, now this is a dual band antenna, 440, 2 meter. I started out with the dimensions that a 2 meter antenna is supposed to be and a 440 antenna J pole is. So this is a fan dipole. You got, this is the dipole and this is the fan part for the 440. In no way does this, any dimension on this thing match up with 440 or 2 meters. <laughs> I mean, 2 meter, you know, should be out here about 40 inches, something like that on this, on this segment. I just started doing what I just said. Cut a little bit, see what, what happened. Cut a little bit, see what happened. Whoops, I'm cutting, but is that affecting this other one that I'm thinking is going to be the 440? So this was an iterative process of back and forth, back and forth, until I came up with this. Now with this antenna, Bob did uh, some uh, anal analyzing for me on his analyzing equipment. And this is the SWR readings across, basically across the amateur bands on those, on those frequencies. Which is really strange, and he, he was kind of, kind of figuring out that it was Probably, you know, the diameter of this gives you broad bandwidth. Uh, the increased diameter will increase the bandwidth on, on your, uh, on your uh, antenna. But it's flat, and I've had people build this in the Azores, Argentina, in uh, Europe, uh, here in the U.S., and get just excellent, uh, you know, reports, and, and you built one, right? I did. Yeah. Works great. Is that... Horizontally polarized or vertically polarized? This is horizontal. This is vertical. <laughs> <laughs> this is on a 45, yeah. This is on the side of Pike's Peak. So, have you, uh, ever, this is totally have you ever built one with uh, uh, bigger coax? With a what? Bigger coax. That looks like a pretty lossy coax for those frequencies. Yeah, well, this is, this is, I usually like to keep it short and then I put better coax from here on because I figure that's really short and it's not going to get that much loss and it makes it light and stuff. Um, but it, um, it, it, work, it works outstanding. The first time that I transmitted with, with the thing after I played with the SWR and getting it tuned, I stepped out into my driveway up in north of Monument about a, a mile north of downtown and was uh, just listening and I heard a contact and it was, it may have been Stu. Um, they were having a camp out at Fort Carson, a, a jamboree type weekend. Wow. And it was, I ended up calculating that I talked with them down there 42 miles around Cheyenne Mountain from my place in Monument. And I go, wow, this thing is really nice. <laughs> so experimenting is great when you can make things out of cheap Home Depot stuff. Is that a, uh, a homemade ballon that you got? Yeah, bar. this is yeah, this is a, a, a basic ballon that you'll find almost anywhere. Six turns of coax, uh, you know, about that size. Although, you know, some people make it bigger, some people make them less, but it, it kind of keeps RF from coming back down to coax. Okay. How directional is that? Um, it's omnidirectional. It's, it's not, uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's directional. It, um, but like, you know, I had it on 5 watts and 42 miles around the side of Cheyenne Mountain and was able to, to talk to people very clearly. Question? Yeah, question. Now here's another antenna. Yeah. I've got a question. Yo. Just a quick question. You said that you thought from the analysis that the diameter of the pipe and or the thickness of the wall of the pipe not so much the thickness of the wall, is the, 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 the RF is on the outside of the pipe, yes. Yeah. Did you ever try a bigger pipe? I haven't yet. The other thing that I'm going to try is making a 6 meter, 10 meter version. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a project that I've got in the back of my head and see, see how that works. Because it, I mean, you know, a 6 meter, 10 meter vertical antenna, that's a big, 
big deal. And if you can downsize it like that, that'd be a great benefit. So this is a, kind of a, a, a dipole antenna, <coughs> kind of uh, on the version of a J-pole. It's straightened out, you might say. Um, and, and the way you would make this is like I showed you, lay it out and have it supported so that you can make sure that the thing is all squared and, and nice and put together. When you're tuning this kind of an antenna, and it's kind of like what happens with a J-pole, you, you take your, your feed lines and connect it to the uh, pipes that are coming this way. And this, basically this portion of this antenna, this is feed line on here. It's almost like having a, a, a ladder line kind of a situation. And what I did is I, I put this thing together, soldered it all up, and I noticed, okay, well, this is nice, but these things are just kind of going to go like this, back and, you know, they'll go back and forth. Uh, so I made these supports by uh, taking a piece of wood, measuring the dimensions from center line to center <coughs> line here, drilled 5 eighth inch holes into the wood, and then sawed it in half, and then ran a screw into the side so that clamps this thing down so these things can't, it can't move anymore, and it won't be able to separate. Um, with this kind of an antenna, when you um, attach it to a pole, you can, you can have this side grounded. You can have this on a metal mast right here. From here back, this has no effect on the antenna. Uh, the effect is from here, wherever these contact points are, forward. Now when you're tuning this, what you do is a similar deal. You set this thing up. Now there's a dimension of like 12 and 3 quarter inches on the drawing that I saw for building this from the center line of this pipe to where the contact point was supposed to be. Well, I set it at uh, 12 and 3 quarter inches and uh, that didn't work very good. SWR was like 2.0, no matter where you were, it just was high. Um, I uh, moved it out to here and things seemed to get better, but it was too much the other way now. And so I, I, the, uh, the frequency uh, up here was like at 150 megahertz, and when I went over here it was about 130. So I just started sliding these back and forth until I got my SWR down, and the frequency on this, this place right here is uh, about one point, the SWR is about 1.2 between about 143 megahertz to about 149 megahertz. So, you know, you just play with it to come up with a, a good antenna. Now, not all antennas are perfect. You could hook up your radio to your outside of your car if there's metal on it, and you can do you a know, bumper, and you can transmit if, you, if you're in an emergency. But you want to try and get the antenna down to, you know, the best spot possible. Um, now... Those are what, just regular copper clamps? Yeah, regular, just copper clamps, uh, uh, half-inch <laughs> copper clamps, and I just kind of re-bend them a little bit so that they're tight. Yeah. And then run a screw through. I had to re-drill a hole uh, in it to be able to get it to clamp tight. Okay. So uh, just nice. copper, copper, copper. Um, and again, the bell one. Hmm? Again, your little bell one down there. Yeah, and, that, and that's just a good thing to do on basically any antenna. So you don't end up with something, you know, coming back down the the, uh, the line. Okay. Although I've run in, I've run it without. I mean, back in the old days, I I never made one of these, uh, and I'm still here. I survived. <laughs> um, who? Yeah, go ahead. How much wattage can you put? Oh, 100, 100 easy. <laughs> Now, you know, when, when the solder joints start melting, then you know you put too much <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, our, our, Is there any our, indicator before that? Our, our it's smoking. Up. It's smoking. But, uh, yeah. I, I, I've never run more than 100 watts okay. since I've been an amateur, and I've talked around the world. Uh, so, it, you know, if you're in a big giant pile up and everybody else is running a kilowatt, you're, you're dead. You're never going to be able to. But most of the, for most of the time, if you can hear the guy, he should be able to hear you as long as you're not, you're not being overridden by everybody. The, uh, 
How many people <coughs> run two meters, like for the net? How many people have antenna problems? Uh, okay. Only one person has antenna problems at two meters? Everybody satisfied with their antennas that they have for two meters? Huh? Okay. You hear some guys on the net and they're pretty clear. Yeah. They're clearer. Yeah. Who'd like to have this antenna? <laughs> Looks like you win. The only thing you're going to need to do is get yourself a cap to the bottom, I, and that'll be your first soldering job. I didn't, I didn't have a cap for that. That's what you put it outside. Stick that right in front Yeah, you can. Yeah, you could. Uh, I wasn't told that there were going to be prizes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, what brings, that's, what, that's what brings people to the next meeting. That's right. That's right. Uh, maybe we need to add something to the net, because I've, I've heard the strong stations that are, are full quieting on the repeater, and I've heard the stations with a lot of noise. I don't know what I am, because there's no signal report, so I don't know if my equipment is working well or not. I know the, uh, I know the net control can hear me. Yeah, well what you, what you do is uh, when you get on the net the next time, ask the net control, what do I sound like, you know, and have them give you a, a full uh, report on what your signal sounds like. Now when you, uh, here's a, a bunch of links, now this will be going up on the website, here's a bunch of links to different, an, different sites that have different types of antenna calculators and designs, all kinds of uh, designs, things, and there's a link to that uh, little soldering a video. Now you can go out on the web and you can find all kinds of, of soldering videos. Uh, real quick, uh, once again Al, sorry to keep interrupting you. Well, there's other little antenna that you have over here. Mm -hmm. Is that on one of these um, sites or is that? What, uh, what I'm going to do is email me and I'll send you the PDF on how to build that antenna. Sweet. Uh, yeah. With all the, you know, all the documentation for building it. Isn't that on our website already? I don't know. The short one? It used to be. That's where I got the plane. Yeah, I think it was. Okay. Well, you might check the website, but if you can't find it, uh, give me a, you know, send me an email and I'll forward that to you. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so on that first one that you showed, you uh, said that you were cutting it shorter and shorter to, to tune it to get your SWR right. This one? Yes. Uh -huh. Now on, on this other one, you said that you're moving the feed line to, um, yeah, your two meter, your two meter. Yeah. Uh, in the back there. And then this one you're moving the feed line around to get the SWR right. So uh, how did you know to move the feed line on this one rather than cut it shorter? Well, I mean feed line like this? This yeah. part? Or? Yeah, so on this one you said you're moving the feed line and that was what you, how you're oh. tuning in. Th this one you don't move the feed line. This one is feeding uh, this uh, as if it was a dipole antenna. Uh, without that kind of a, a setup for the antenna. This one is just like if you're, if it's a wire antenna and you just feed right, at, right in the middle and there is no other moving on the feed line. It's all in the element length. So what part are you trimming when you trim that one? This, I just, this started out with 40 inch segments of pipe here and I forget what the length was here, but I just kept trimming, trimming, and going back and forth between them until I got the SWR down on both bands. Now, um, I did go too far a couple times, so I ended up having to cut another piece of pipe and stick it out here because I didn't want a lot of couplings in there. Mm. Uh, and did you have to, were you soldering the cap on each time when you tested it? No, or? no, I just, just slapped it on there. Yeah. So the, the, cap, the cap didn't affect it that much. It's mostly the, the length of the pipe. That centerpiece is not standard PVC. It's a CPV. Or yeah, something. and Lowe's carries it. Home Depot doesn't carry them. Right. Yeah, Home Depot did, but they they yeah. stopped carrying. They stopped carrying it. So it's a, to fit the copper pipe. You can't use standard PVC. Yeah. So now you've got to look for whatever that other. Right device. now, if you let's say that uh, oh geez, you know I can't find this anyplace. Well, what you can do is you can get a piece of three quarter inch uh, coupling that has threads in it. 
and get a get the half inch fitting adapter that would go in there if you were connecting up to a half inch pipe and use that kind of you want to kind of keep the same distance between them I haven't played that much with you know spreading this thing way out I don't think you want to want to do that but it's just fine you can use a piece of wood uh, really doesn't matter do you know how this would be affected if you had like say a metal wall behind it or a you know like chicken wire like in a Home. Yeah, it's it's going to affect it's it. Gonna affect it's going to pattern, of course. Your, yeah, your uh, your transmission through that is not going to be as good, and it's going to start bouncing. You, you know, you could get a little uh, on the yeah, a little screen. reflection uh, coming would back. Would affect the SWR. It would, it would. It would. But what you'd want to do in that case is you'd want to take the antenna, and you'd want to move it back and forth <coughs> in that field of that wall to find out where's your SWR the lowest and, uh, and because you're having some coupling to that wall, okay? And so you want to uh, move this thing back and forth until you end up with the lowest SWR. Oh, I read online using a slinky. Yeah, oh yeah. Is I've that really those. true? You can oh yeah, you can use a slinky. Uh, I had... Uh, uh, that becomes a helically wound antenna is what it is. And uh, what you do is you end up, uh, I think on a slinky, you'd use twice the length of the wire in the uh, coil than you would of a normal length for the, a given frequency. Uh, I had uh, first uh, messed around with helically wound uh, antennas up in Golden when I lived up there. I had some banister rail that it was, it was about as long as, oh, I guess it's maybe a 12, 12 foot chunk. And what I did is I took speaker wire and wound enough on there for uh, 40 meters going in one direction and wound enough for 40 meter, twice, twice the normal length of a 40 meter length going the other way and then uh, attached that, that wire on both ends real well and wound it as tight as I could and then went back to that, you know the speaker wire, the thin copper stuff that has two leads, went back and peeled out one of those wires um, and I don't know what I used that for eventually but I had uh, and then it just attached coax to the center section and I had one end of that antenna sitting on a refrigerator, on a refrigerator and I had the other end resting on top of my radial arm saw. So the only space I had to do it with it was in a basement. And I uh, tuned it up. I had a uh, uh, old uh, Heathcraft uh, DX60 uh, transmitter, CW transmitter. I tuned it up for the, you know the best tuning I could. Started pounding the key. Ended up talking to a guy in Seattle. And I go, wow, it really works, you know. So uh, that's how most of your uh, uh, like C CB antennas and stuff, uh, and the uh, uh, antennas that ham radio guys use, the ham stick stuff, antennas type things, they're helically wound for quite a ways, and then they have a whip sticking out the end for the final tuning. But uh, helically wound antennas work. So this, I wanted to ask you about wire for antennas. This, yeah. this antenna has kind of like official antenna wire, right? It's yeah. stranded, number 14, and it's bare. When, right. when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, do you have like a favorite wire you tend to look at? You want stranded, because it gets, it ends up when an antenna is sitting out in the wind and stuff, it starts flexing a lot. And eventually uh, the uh, solid will work harden and you'll end up with breaks in it. So you want stranded wire. 12 gauge is usually what I like to use for antennas and that's what that wire is on that uh, piece that's going around wherever it is. That little guy? That yeah. little guy? The no, there it is. Do the you have a house price? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> you have a house price? Yeah. I lost my child. I want to give So, uh, yeah, 12 gauge I, I, I find is a good size for antenna. Is that like, do you know, is that like THHN? Yeah, THHN, yeah. Okay, that's, that's electrical wire that they usually run through conduit. Right, 
Right. Yeah. Pretty cheap. Have you ever uh, messed around with what they call a mystery antenna, multi-band antenna that has wire interspersed with coax? Mm -mm, I haven't. No. Uh, the old boy that designed it no, I have to look or came it. up with it passed away, but. There's a guy down in Florida that claims he's making them uh, using that guy's mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. And it works a little bit better than a G5RB. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about wisdom antenna? No, this is called a mystery antenna. <coughs> well, this, this, the mystery this, is, I can't explain why. <laughs> <laughs> this, this antenna I, I named the Mighty Wolf, W-O-O-F. And uh, it reminds me of the Wolf Hong. That uh, <laughs> that you know, um, person, person, no, yeah, person. Yeah, Hiram Percy uh, had uh, in the early days of the ARRL. It was kind of a nasty-looking thing that they threatened people with. If you weren't going to be good, uh, <laughs> it was made out of wood. But uh, that's kind of how this thing got its name. If you uh, if you go out on the web and you search the Mighty Wolf. Uh, Lately, I found that pretty much this is the first thing that comes up, and then the next thing, about two down, is dog food or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions? How about wire antennas? When you just an in fed wire antenna? Yeah. Every antenna that we've seen this evening is, is using two feeds or has two wires attached to it. But if you go up to a single line, a counterpoise. Yeah, you, you need to have a ground someplace in the system, and the ground is the other half of the antenna. Uh, you can wind a torrid coil with it as long as you do the right ratios and the right cut of torrid. You can do that. That's how the antenna is done. Do you, do you recommend or do you, can you recommend any kind of antenna switcher, homebrew? Or just go research? Just Simple relays, uh, you can go to OEM Electronics across the street and pick up some uh, Potter Broomfield um, relays, 12 volt relays, and that, that are good, you know, good size relays, and they can work for antenna switching. You know, what you want to watch for is if, uh, when you're starting to do switching, if you're seeing a lot of arcing, eventually your con silver contacts are going to burn away, but, uh, you know, you, you can. You can take two wires and just keep going like this with them too. Yeah. <laughs> Wash machine, really. Wash machine. Yeah. Bob, I, I don't think this is going to work on 80 meters. <laughs> no, that's, that's that's a much higher frequency. Okay. It's, it's how, you look at you look at that antenna. That will work. You know, depending on the length of wire, that'll work for two meters. That'll work for four for you, 440. Yeah, for a... I, I'd like to try and cut one for 1.2 gig. <laughs> there is um, so Eric asked about N-fed yeah. half waves. There is to me. There's kind of a maybe a trend towards that being a, a popular antenna. It used used to be everybody put up a half wave dipole, but you have right. to feed it in the center, and then people start figuring out. Okay, I can feed it from the end. Mm -hmm. It takes it takes a special matching network, but it's it's essentially a dipole that's fed from the end. Right. And half wave. Half wave. Half wave right. and very popular because you can imagine it's, it's easier to mount in a lot of cases. Yeah. And the, the feed line can come off the end. Yeah, with the, the soda guys use it a lot for HF. When you, when you, uh, and when you dipole feed, your, your side wave of, the, of the, the signal that's going out runs like this, okay? When you're end feeding, you end up you need a piece of wire that is solid, and you're still going to end up with that sine wave, but it goes along the whole length of the wire. That signal needs an end in order to bounce back and be able to oscillate nice and clean. You don't want a chunk of your sine wave falling off the end. Uh, it's not too bad if it's too short. That's how people end up with long wire antennas that are. 200 feet long and it still works on 40 meters and 80 meters and 160 meters or whatever. But if it's too short, you start having your signal go out and it, it doesn't have an end where it can kind of go back to zero on the current and be able to just come back smoothly. It starts bouncing back and that's when you start getting uh, 
funny ele electrical things going on in your shack. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Got the roster here. Any